Good morning. Thank you very much to Tom Trivers and the rest of the program committee for the invitation. It's a great honor. I think one of the reasons that I was asked to talk about STM is because I think within our community there's a, a slight sense that STM is a, is a gem that's been perhaps overlooked. Um, you know, the rest of the software industry made a big uh, song and dance about STM maybe about 10 years ago or so. And to some extent, they've kind of moved on. I think in part because they didn't really manage to make it work out very well in, in most languages, and it hasn't been that widely adopted. But it has actually worked out really well in Haskell. And so I think that's why uh, people are interested uh, to, to hear about the experience that uh, uh, me and my colleagues have had recently with, with using STM in a, in a large commercial project. So that is the intention, is to share um, you know, success stories and also uh, what we've learned and patterns uh, hopefully it will be uh, useful and reusable. So let's get on. So if you want the too long didn't watch summary, um, I think the, the, the conclusion, the takeaway is that STM really does work. It really does make things easier. But, you know, it's not a magic bullet. Concurrency is still hard. But it, it really does make, make some things easier, the overall implementation easier, the designs easier. And in particular, what I want to talk about in, as part of this talk is um, some interesting design patterns that, that become um, much more obvious, let's say. I don't, I'm not going to claim that they are you know, not doable in, in other systems or other approaches, but they become easier to think about easier to, and easier to implement um, when using STM. So I'm a consultant, and very often consultants get called in uh, not to help design a new project, but when things are going badly. And so it, it's not that uncommon that I, uh, I see a customer uh, and they're having performance problems or, or system performance problems, which very often have to do with concurrency, not necessarily Haskell specific. And, and so I ask them, um, what, what's your design for, for system overload? And unfortunately, all too often, the answer is, mm, well, we haven't really thought about that, or I've got a bounded queue somewhere, um, uh, or back pressure, what's back pressure? Um, so sadly, that's that's far too common. Um, you know, concurrency is difficult. Um, we don't, we sometimes don't think about it enough. Uh, we, we think about the rosy situation, not the worst case situation. Now, if you were to get you know one step beyond, you would say, uh, well, what does your demand versus throughput curve look like? That's the, the the graph of the demand on the system, requests, for example, and throughput, or some appropriate measure of throughput for the system, dealing processing requests, processing transactions, depending on you know what the system is for. So what, is your, what does that curve look like? Of course, people don't really know that because they haven't done the measurements. But if you measure, these are the, the three sort of uh, characteristic uh, shapes of, of that curve. Perfect would be you know, it just goes straight up and then it maxes out at its maximum capacity and then just stays there solidly, irrespective of the uh, additional load. More commonly, uh, you have the, the situation where it goes up and then it reaches some peak and then it tails off. And so that's, that's becoming less efficient uh, as it becomes more overloaded uh, and it, it, it is not achieving its maximum capacity. And the worst case, of course, is that you know, it gets to some peak and then really just falls off to zero. It just trips over its own feet and really stops making any forward progress at all, which is sadly far too common. So wouldn't it be nice if our standard concurrency you know, design primitives, building blocks, uh, gave us something more like the former and less like the latter? So that was part of the background for thinking about um, a project that I've been involved in now for the last um, well, about 20 months or so, uh, re rebuilding uh, Cardano, uh, the Cardano node implementation. So what is this? So the project context is it's a it's a blockchain. Um, it's a, it's one of the top 10 um, blockchain cryptocurrencies. Uh, I say that not to not to show off, but to point out that people genuinely care about. Whether you are a you know, blockchain believer or not, um, some people are, and they believe it has real value. And so that gives you a technical context in which people are interested in attacking it if they can. Um, you, you have to have this design idea, this design principle of they really are out to get you. That, that's, that's the way you have to think about designing these kinds of systems. Because people really will attack these systems um, if, if they can, if you give them the opportunity to do so. 
so part of the other technical context is that yeah, this was a, uh, a from scratch uh, design, um, a second second generation system uh, that we were fortunately able to be involved with from from the beginning rather than being told in at the end, which is nice, and a a, a distributed blockchain system is by its nature extremely concurrent. There's lots and lots of network interactions, and the natural way to do that, to design things, is, is to have internal concurrency as well. There's, there's really a great deal of, of concurrency going on. And correctness is vital. You know, as I say, people will attack it, uh, exploit it in any way, including performance, if they, if they can. Because getting a system to fall over is almost as good as um, as many other sort of more you know, clever cryptographic attacks. So there was a number of interesting ideas that I sort of picked up um, from, from previous projects, in particular one where I've been working with some networking experts. And there's a few design principles that, that I saw from that, which I think actually are, are transferable, um, not just in kind of low-level networking, but, but slightly more generally in, in system design. And one of these things is that queues often make designs, makes things work, worse in, in overload situations. Um, in particular, there's a, there's a sort of timing variable. Another thing is that, is that pool-based designs are often better than push-based designs. That is, if I request work uh, rather than being having work you know, pushed upon me, um, that, that can lead to uh, much better designs for, um, for overload situations. Um, back pressure becomes much more natural uh, in, that, in that style. Um, one of the key ideas is that you want to aim for designs that do not become less efficient under load. Ideally, you might be able to make more efficient but not becoming less efficient under load is one of the key things that will lead you to those, those curves that go up and then just stay there at their maximum capacity rather than tailing off um, uh, towards zero. Those are becoming less efficient as they become more overloaded. And there's another very interesting uh, sort of intellectual framework which, which I got from, from this, which is um, the delta Q performance algebra. And sadly, uh, I don't have enough time in this talk to, to go into that, um, but maybe I can give a, a pointer at the end. Um, so this gives us some initial design ideas for, for Cardano, uh, this, this, this previous project. Um, and, and particularly one of these was the, you know, the pool-based and the avoiding queues. So um, the initial design idea was to aim for a mostly or fully queueless design, um, to use SGM just consistently everywhere, rather than trying to mix different styles. And this, it was clear that concurrency was going to be a big deal and it was going to be difficult. So we tried to make things as easy as possible and actually, performance is actually not the biggest issue. Consistency, reliability uh, are the biggest issues. And you have to worry about the worst case resource consumptions and not the average case, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, if, if the attacker can push you from the average case into the worst case and you do worse in terms of resource consumption between the two, that's a bad thing. Um, the attacker can push you over a, a resource limit. OK, let's blast through the STM primitives. So, because I think most people are relatively familiar with, with STM, um, but let's just do a quick refresh. So, STM is a monad, so you can have you know, sequences of STM actions, um, and those primitive actions are creating transactional variables, reading and writing those transactional variables, and then the key piece of magic is being able to atomically execute a whole transaction, you know, some composition of, of reads and writes. Now, the semantics of that being atomic is that different transactions executed, executed in different threads appear as if there is some serializable order in which those STM uh, transactions occur you, with the natural meaning of the reads and writes on those variables. So it, it appears to be a completely sequential uh, execution. That's the semantics. And the, the implementation trick, trickery is that this happens actually concurrently. So this gives you a very simple model because you can just see that things happen in one order or the other but no funny mixtures. But what makes STM really powerful, in my view, um, is, is blocking. I mean, hardware transactional uh, memory gives you just the reads and writes, but the blocking is really fundamental uh, to, um, to concurrency. Um, for, for, you need it for synchronizing between threads. So the, the extra primitive that STM uh, enhancement gives you is retry and or else. So retry uh, lets you block on any condition, which is very powerful. It's not, you know, with n bars, you can just block on trying to acquire um, the n bar, trying to lock or unlock uh, the n bar. Whereas in STM, you can block on arbitrary 
arbitrary conditions, arbitrary properties of the values that you've, you've read. And also we have uh, we have or else, which which lets you combine alternative uh, blocking SDM matchings in a in a modular way. Um, we make use of the fact uh, later on that uh, STM is an instance of the alternative type class, which lets us use the nice alternative operator and the guard uh, function. So let's talk more about the ability to block. Um, as I said, you can block on any condition. So for example, you, know, you read some variables and then you can block on some predicate, some condition of the, of the variables you've read. So what does that mean? It means that we, you know, we do a bunch of reads, we conditionally, or retry, that's what the guard does. If we do call retry, the effect is that our thread is suspended. And um, when when does it get woken up again? When does it get retried? When does it when can it have another go? Well, it's when any of some time after any of those variables that we have read get written to by other threads. So this means we end up monitoring, you know, blocking and monitoring some set of, of threads that we have, uh, some set of t-bars that we have read. So that's very, very flexible. You know, we, have, we, can, we can block on many different things, um, all the variables that we have read so far. Um, so there's a couple of important corollaries of this. One is that yeah, we get woken up sometime after one of these threads, uh, one of these uh, t-bars gets, gets written to. So we're not guaranteed to see every single change of t-bars that we are monitoring. We, we simply see some later value of the t-bar at some point when we get woken up. I mean, you know, usually it's relatively prompt, but there's no guarantee, and that's an important thing. And the other uh, in interesting corollary is that because we block on the, the t-bars that we have read so far, we can defer, you know, if we don't need to read uh, a t-bar before blocking, it's better to defer it until after, after retry. Uh, so in the example here, we have, um, you know, we're reading two variables, but we only, our, con our blocking condition happens to only make use of one variable, so we can defer the read uh, afterwards. And that means that we only need to block on one t-bar rather than having to monitor two. Um, and, and that means that you know, wake-ups, we don't get you know, uh, useless wake-ups based on write to, to the second t-bar. So let's talk about the alternatives. Um, so in this example, we have uh, first to finish, saying the first of these things to finish is what, is, is what the answer that the first to finish uh, operator does. Um, and we're, we're blocking on you know, three different things, and whichever one finishes first, you know, whichever one doesn't block, uh, is that's the one that will give us the result. So this lets us block and wait on multiple different different alternatives. Each of those alternatives can themselves use you know, read and write and retry. Um, so this lets us build up you know, complicated conditions in a modular way. Um, as our core programmers, we all know that is a very useful and powerful thing. Now, I think there's another interesting thing about STM within Haskell, is that STM in Haskell can be, no, should be, in my view, um, a unified framework for blocking on everything. Um, it, it's almost there, but not quite, not quite conveniently. Now, why is this important? If you look around at other languages, and particularly if you look at operating system interfaces, they're often extremely ad hoc and inflexible in that you've got, particularly with looking at operating, operating system APIs, you've got you know, APIs for blocking on some kinds of I.O., like sockets, but not disk files, or vice versa. Um, or you've got you know, APIs for blocking on time, you know, timeout, um, or certain kinds of other inter-thread communication. Um, but, but very few operating systems have good, and, and you know, this is only reflected from the languages, have good APIs for blocking on arbitrary combinations of everything. Right? You've got these special purpose APIs, but not things that unify in a way that let you block on this or that. I mean, Windows is actually slightly better than most operating systems in that regard, except that it has you know, this arbitrary limitation of not being able to block on more than 64 things at once. So then immediately that becomes useless for, for blocking on, uh, on sockets and not just applications where you've got thousands of these things. So yeah, this is a this is a problem. You know, and if you read the blogs of, of the people who try to write libraries which try to track all these things, it's pretty much horrendous. Uh, and and this is not also not well reflected in, in in language support. So my contention is that within Haskell, STM ought to be that unifying framework. Um, that you know, it, it gives us interthread synchronization. You know, that that's its primary purpose, and so it does that extremely well. But 
can also do the other two, do you know, Blossom on Time and Blossom on AO. Um, and so there's a little known feature um, that, of, of STM that you can block on, on timeouts uh, in, in STM. So that means that you can use time in combination with uh, interpolate uh, synchronization. Um, you can do a register delay, same number of milliseconds, and it gives you a T-bar, uh, which goes from false to true when the timeout occurs. Um, it's not perfect, but um, it's, it's, it's good enough. Um, you can also do I.O., but it would cost an extra, an extra thread and an extra synchronization. Okay, so let's talk about how we are using STM within Cardano. Um, and in particular, the patterns that, that we have used uh, and found to be very useful. So I'll, I'll give a concrete example a little later, but I want to start with the, the sort of general idea and the general pattern, um, or general ideas, and, um, and, then we'll, and then we'll go to, to concrete examples. Um, so if we start with no constraints, we have just STM as a, as a raw soup of, of threads and transaction variables and actions that can, transactions that can read and write variables. But we want to um, have a slightly more disciplined approach here. So we want to say <coughs> that the, the data flow, we're, we're not using STM here as, as a database, right? We're not using it as uh, in a classic shared state kind of way where uh, threads read and write variables. We're using it for channels of communication, uh, conduits of information to get from one thread to another. It's, it's inter-thread communication. That's, that's what it's for. So We'll, we'll impose a constraint that, that all of these variables are used in a unidirectional style. You know, one thread will write to them, maybe several threads will write to them, and another thread will read for them, but they won't be going both directions from you know, between a thread and a, and a variable. Now, we're going to um, associate the, the transactional variables with the components that write to them. Right? Um, you could do it the way around, but I think it, it, it makes a lot more sense to, to look at it this way and say that the, the T bars are owned by components that write to them. Um, now, we don't particularly want to, you know, we're, we're trying to make a, a modular way of, of building concurrent components. So we don't want to have these T bars being exposed because that makes them read write. Um, so we're going to make them, uh, we're going to expose opaque STM queries, which in, in turn, internally, um, might be as simple as just reading a single T bar. And the way to think about this, or the way that I think about this, is that these STM queries are time-varying observations. So these are observables, uh, these, these STM queries. A um, little FRP-ish, maybe. Um, now, it doesn't actually matter the internal construction of the, the components where we are observing uh, their, their observables. And so in particular, it doesn't matter if they are so-called active or, or passive, if they have you know, permanent uh, internal threads that animate them or if they only become animated make changes to their uh, observables um, you know, whenever threads interact with them, or the threads animate them. So that, that doesn't matter. What's important is that we have you know, these components. The, 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 the pattern is that the, the components expose um, these observables, these, these STM queries. Um, and then other components can observe them, can see them, can access those, those observables, those queries, and act on relevant changes. So there's a number of properties of, of, of this kind of pattern uh, and advantages. Um, one, one of them is that it doesn't need to be, it's quite modular in the sense that um, these components who are exposing these queries don't need to know anything about the consumers. Right? In, in a standard message passing style, you have to send a message to someone, which means you need to know who to send it to. Now, you can reverse that by um, introducing a you know, subscribe but this, this can do it in a very, very simple and straightforward way. You just expose the query, anyone can call it, and it doesn't make any difference to you because it's all read-only. It doesn't have any effect on, 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 on your component um, exposing these things. Um, so this can preserve abstraction boundaries quite nicely um, because the STM queries, you know, they don't expose the T-bars, they just query, uh, they just read certain T-bars. They can read any number of T-bars. You know, it doesn't have to be just a single one. And you can project or select out <coughs> Just information uh, that you want to expose. Um, so you can have a there's a bit of wiggle room between between the internal documentation, um, which might be you know, multiple T bars or nested maps of, 
sea bar and the information that gets fired to the, through the query. Um, so this is very nice. It gives you this way of exposing information, exposing these observables to other components, and then other components can gather information from many other, you know, many components. Right? The, the the observer can combine information from multiple components that don't need to know about each other. That's, so there's another you know, modularity uh, advantage. So then the, the the observer then has to you know, make use of this information. So it has to observe the relevant uh, observables and then act on relevant changes. And what's relevant to one observer might be it varies, right? You know, what's relevant to one is is not not to another. Different different observers can be you know, acting for different purposes. Uh, and so you know, what's yeah, what's relevant to one component it might be different to what's relevant to another. Um, things to think about when you're writing in this style um, is that there's no implicit notion of change. Um, like with a, an event queue or a, or a message passing, you know, they're, they're simply the receiving a message or the next item in the queue is itself telling you that something has changed. In, in this state observation pattern, um, there's no implicit notion of that. You're just reading the current value. So we need to explicitly identify when something of interest has changed. And we do that using a fingerprint. So a fingerprint is just a function of the things that we've queried, the, the variables that we've read, um, that selects a, a, a selects out the information that's, that when that when that fingerprint such that when that fingerprint changes, then we know that something of interest has changed. Um, and that might be things like just selecting um, you know, certain subsets of information, because um, you want these fingerprints to be relatively easy to compute and easy to compare, so they don't want to be too large. So ideally something small or constant size that can be compared in constant time is what you're aiming for with a fingerprint. And that might You might have to do something like hashing, um, but quite often there are um, salient bits of information that you can select out which tell you that if this changes, it means that something of interest has changed. So you need to read the relevant variables and then select out just the parts that you need. Now, you might also want to do additional observations or read, you know, observe additional things after having determined that the fingerprint has changed. Um, because when you act on uh, the fact that something has changed, you may need to know more information than just something changed, or that the fingerprint, you know, the especially if doing something like the fingerprint being a hash, the fingerprint on its own is not useful for any purpose other than being a fingerprint. But you, know, you, you may want to return uh, a wider range of information um, to be able to act on the, the change than was necessary to determine that there was a change. Um, so this whole thing then is done in a, in, a, in a continuous loop. So the pattern overall is that you are blocking, you know, STM action that blocks on the relevant changes, returns a coherent, you know, consistent snapshot of, of, of the values of the observables that are useful, returns those. So that's one, you know, one big STM action. It blocks until something changed, returns the information that's useful. And then you act on that change, act on uh, the state that, that you observed. And then when you're done, you've got a new fingerprint, and you go back and do it again. And that might mean that you block again, or you might, you know, maybe in the meantime, um, further state may have actually changed, and you may just immediately go and uh, uh, go straight down the loop again. So here's the, the pattern in code. Um, we, we start by reading all of our trigger uh, variables, our trigger queries. These are the ones that we actually uh, use as part of our fingerprint. So we do all those, read those, and then we construct our fingerprint, you know, some, some function of the things that we've queried. Then we check if our fingerprint has changed. Right? We, we got the fingerprint, the current fingerprint passed in. We've constructed our new one based on the, on the queries, um, and we see if it's changed. And we use guard to retry uh, if, if nothing changed. Continue if the fingerprint did change. So if the fingerprint did change and we're not we're not in a blocking situation, then now we can read all the additional state that we need, all the other observables that we might need for uh, acting on the information, uh, acting on the fact that something has just now changed. So then we construct our snapshot of, of that state, you know, uh, selecting out the, the bits that are useful, and return that useful state and the new fingerprint, so that in the overall outer loop we can you know, reuse that that new fingerprint next time round. So when we act on that current state, 
we yeah, we have to just do exactly that. We have to act on that current state. We, we have to remember that we are not getting you know, the sequence of changes. We're not being told you know, that directly what changed. We simply get you know, the current values of, of those observables. Now, you could reconstruct some, some diffs, um, some changes, if that was uh, really the only way to do it. But this, this sort of style encourages a pattern where you just act on the current states. You just see what it is, make the best decision that you can based on that. Um, so this means that you know there, there may have been, you have to think about the fact that there may have been many changes between you know, the, the last spin point and the new spin point. Um, but if you can, avoid having to figure out what every single change is and just act on the current state. Um, so there's more consequences of this. Um, one is that um, if we can follow that style, then we, th this gets back to the point I made at the very beginning about these you know, performance curves, um, is that we can we can avoid becoming less efficient as we become more overloaded. If we are able to act just on the current state without having to keep track of every single intermediate change, we, in fact, we may even have an opportunity to become more efficient as we become more overloaded, as we simply make decisions less frequently based on larger and larger batches of of changes, but at least we should be able to avoid becoming more, you know, becoming uh, less efficient um, uh, by having to. Where, whereas, if you're doing an event style, you can't avoid processing every single intermediate event; otherwise, you'll miss something. Whereas in this style, missing something is okay because we're acting in a, in a level-triggered style, not an event-triggered style. Um, now, here's a real example. Um, as I said, this this pattern is, a, is an extraction of Real example, and I'll, I'll try and just very briefly um, summarize this because the exact details are not that interesting. But I want to point out here that we've got you know, three components. Um, these compa the, the chain sync and the chain DB components are relatively independent of each other, so you know, we're getting uh, modularity, um, and we're able to use concurrency for its intended purpose, which is structuring programs in a, in a modular way. Um, programs that allow us to deal with external events. We're not and the, the, the block fetch component, which is the, the one that's actually really interesting here, um, is, is observing you know, the, these observables from these other components. Um, they don't have to know about um, block fetch, not directly, so again, you know, modularity. Um, modularity of the consumer, as well as, so we, you know, we've got modularity between the fact there's separate components that ex expose observables and the fact that you know, the consumer is different from both of them. So, yeah, the, the block fetch is making a, a non-trivial decision based on uh, four different um, trigger, trigger queries and several more non-trigger queries. To, to make the best decision, it, it uses additional auxiliary information beyond, beyond just the information that's used to show you're making that decision. Um, another thing you'll notice here is that um, uh, there, there are loops. Now, that doesn't go against what I said at the beginning about you know, uh, unidirectional uh, data flow. Each of these variables, particularly if you look at the, the relationship between um, the, uh, the fetch decision thread and the fetch protocol thread, there's, there's, a, there's a loop going on there. But you know, the, the, they're, they're, they go via different um, transactional variables. So each of these transactional variables is being used in a unidirectional style. But overall, um, this gives you a loop. Uh, and you know, that, that kind of thing is, is important for, um, for control. You know, the, the fetch decision uh, thread has to take account of the fact of previous decisions. Um, although it's able to do that in a style that's not diff based, it's, it's all still current state based. Um, and there's a further um, uh, loop, which is that um, the, the, the fetch protocol, which actually goes and downloads um, uh, blockchain block bodies and presents them to the chain database. And then they may end up uh, being incorporated into the chain, in which case they end up in the fetch block uh, query, or under, you know, underlying fetch entity was. Um, and then that's that's part of a, a further um, data flow loop. So yeah, we still, you know, we, we can have these you know, non-trivial uh, loops um, within this style. Um, another thing you notice is there's really quite a few threads going on here. I mean, the, the protocol threads, there's one protocol thread per peer. 
which is you know, the, the nice classic style. Each of those protocol threads can be used, you know, s uh, simple sequential blocking style, and we're using concurrency again for its intended purpose of building these things in a measurable way. Um, I want to talk briefly also about a, another variation of, of this pattern, um, uh, where, where we have, well, so in the, in the previous example, we were building up you know, one big complicated decision based on many observations. But there are other examples where you want to be able to have, um, you know, make, take some action um, based on you know, certain conditions, and there may be many of those actions, each of them based on different conditions. So you've got some guarded action, you know, take some corrective action to achieve some outcome, you know, guarded by a certain condition. And, you want, and these things are non-trivial, and you want to be able to write them separately, and then combine them. And STMs or else, the, the alternative operator, uh, are perfect for that. Um, so in this pattern, you've got some internal state for your component. So again, you've got some, some co concurrent component that's making observations of other, of other components, but it's got some internal state, it has this control loop, it has some guarded actions that may depend purely on internal state, um, just ordinary purely functional cosmetry pseudo. And then you have other uh, guarded actions, uh, which just use STM to be able to uh, make observations uh, on another uh, another variable, other observables. So the, 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 the pattern here then looks like this. Um, we have a loop, uh, just, like, just like in the last example, where we, we block on, you know, we atomically execute this, uh, this composition of, uh, of guarded alternatives. Um, the guarded alternatives then are just defined, you know, each one defined separately, and we compose them using or else, we use the alternative operator. Um, and it, that's less biased, so we you know, have to think about the order in which we structure those. Uh, that's that's you know, application dependent, of course. In this example, um, we are using asynchronous actions as well. So some of the guarded actions that we can do don't just locally update the current state of the component, but can do things. And sometimes it makes sense to do those things asynchronously. Um, and you know, the examples we have in this, uh, in, this in this Cardano, it, it, it certainly does. So you'll notice that one of the actions that we have at the bottom of this set of guarded actions here is waiting for an asynchronous job to complete. Um, and that sort of ties the, ties the knot of this thing, that you, know, you can kick off some action asynchronously, and when it completes, that is you know, a further event, um, which can cause further local state changes, which or potentially further um, asynchronous jobs to be uh, to be kicked off, and so that gives you, you know, a loop that's always responsive and is able to do things asynchronously and wait for asynchronous things to complete. So in the in the concrete example um, that, that this is an abstraction of, um, the, the best example is is Cardano's peer-to-peer -peer networking um, control loop. It keeps track of uh, sets of peers, um, cold, hot, warm, depending on uh, the relationship, the, the, the current state of those peers. Um, we have targets, and then we have like you know we're trying to achieve a thousand cold peers and ten hot peers, this kind of thing. Um, and then we have actions that are guarded on, on some of those actions are guarded just on their state. Like are we above target for hot peers? In which case we should kick some to drop, or are we below target for cold peers? In which case we should go find some more. And then other actions are guarded on you know, STM observables, you know, external things, um, such as have the targets changed, or have there been failures in, con in the connections, uh, or jobs that we kicked off earlier in case of an asynchronous one. Okay, testing. We have to talk about testing. This stuff is still very hard. I mean, concurrency is still very difficult to, to do really reliably uh, when you're doing anything you know, non-trivial. Um, so testing is particularly important Kind of thing. You know, the harder the problem you're dealing with, the more important the testing. So we need, you know, really good strategies that give us a proper degree of confidence. So the strategy that we uh, have taken is is deterministic simulation with uh, quick check style and property based testing, um, and that and that has proved to be extremely effective. Um, so we we're using two different styles of uh, of, of specifying properties with quick check. Um, State machine style, um, where you define a, a, a model and then you compare uh, against the model, uh, and also a more classic um, process calculus style, um, you know, you specify properties as uh, properties over the trace of execution of a concurrent program. 
there's, and there's many, many properties that you can express in that style. Um, so for simulation, what we've, what we've done is like some type classes that abstract over a bunch of IO effects, um, all the effects to do with concurrency and time, um, and uh, written a simulator uh, and uh, made uh, the appropriate type class instances so that we can run the exact same code, the real production code, we can run it in IO for real, and we can run it in simulation. And I think that has been really, really important. There are existing libraries out there which, which are actually, in some ways, frankly, better for, for doing clever concurrency testing. But the, the ability for us to write you know, the exact same code and run it both ways, and that and that I/O code be standard, right? Not have to be, don't have to teach people different APIs. It's the standard I/O uh, interfaces, the standard threading, STM, standard uh, interfaces and APIs. But just being able to run it both ways um, has proven to be not just doable, but extremely useful and effective. So um, here's an example uh, on the on slide of um, you know, capturing STM in particular uh, in, in some type classes, relatively straightforward stuff, uh, with IO being the natural instance, but we also make uh, um, our simulator an instance of the same, the same monad, uh, the same type classes. Most of them happen to be monads. So the, the simulator um, that we wrote is, is pure, deterministic, and it uses ST under the hood um, to be efficient, but nevertheless pure. Um, it implements a full but simple thread scheduler, um, which is not as difficult as it might sound. I mean, I, uh, it sounds slightly intimidating at first, but it, in the end, uh, it's, it's not, not that complicated. Um, I did have to quite carefully read the, the papers on the semantics of STM and asynchronous exceptions. Um, that stuff is a bit subtle. That's probably the most subtle aspect of, of writing a simulator like this. Um, but it's doable. Um, it gives you faster than real time execution, um, which is a slight joke, I suppose, but um, uh, it, it's really important when you're writing code that deals with time, uh, that has timeouts. And if you're writing network code, you know, of course, there's timeouts all the time. Um, and you want to write those timeouts with the real values that you want for those timeouts uh, expressed in seconds and milliseconds. Um, you don't want to have to you know, tweak those timeouts for the purpose of tests. So you want to be able to run these things in simulated time, but faster than real time. Um, so you, know, you, you can run these um, things where you can simulate you know, hours and hours and hours and, uh, because the timeouts are wrong, um, but, but run it obviously very quickly. Um, other aspects of time that are very important uh, in, in a simulation like this, or in any system like this, that we have to be able to simulate, is clocks. So we have you know, the real wall clock time, or the real simulated wall clock time, um, uh, UTC time, and then you've got a mono monotonic clock. Uh, and it's important to have that distinction because it allows you to test things like the real monotonic clock jumping, or going forwards or backwards, um, whereas the monotonic clock um, is a pretty monotonic thing. Um, the simulator produces a trace, and that's important for being able to uh, to write these properties, the properties that work over uh, the trace of events. And in particular, we have to be able to include custom program events, not just like low-level uh, events that the simulator can see, you know, STM actions and whatever, um, but high-level events produced by the code, so that um, we can then write properties that are interesting, that, that are over the you know, the relevant the relevant events um, for the application itself. So, um, yeah, the, the example here is the uh, run sim uh, fun functions, and the key point is that they're, they're pure, um, and therefore deterministic. Um, and you can see from the types that they must be using ST internals, or strong internals. Um, so we do this extensively within Cardano, and it's really been, I think, extremely effective. Um, as I said, two different styles of, of properties, state machines or, or traces. Um, and examples of where we've used this to, to great effect, I think, um, we've done uh, file system fault injection um, for, for testing our, um, our file system style databases, um, which is so hard to test otherwise. Um, but you know, we, can, we can be really confident, actually, that uh, our, our chain database, which stores the chain, um, is, is properly resistant to 
noisy, file system failure, etc., but also silent corruption. Um, and that's not the kind of confidence you can get if you're using uh, well, pretty much any other technique. We can do simulated full cluster um, testing, um, testing that consensus is actually achieved between uh, distributed uh, consensus algorithms. Um, we can do some degree of um, performance testing, actually. Um, because there's time, uh, and, and we can do simulated delays uh, in the simulation, we can actually do certain kinds of network um, performance testing, checking that you know, we do achieve um, certain performance goals given, given how long it takes to send information from here to there. Um, we can even do certain kinds of properties like checking for live lock, live lock avoidance. Um, for example, in the peer-to-peer -peer simulator, uh, sorry, peer-to-peer -peer component that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's a control loop. And one of the dangers with those things is that you can end up accidentally busy waiting, or, or not busy waiting, but busily, you know, repeatedly executing an action that you didn't really intend to. Um, so it looks like, you know, if you look at the trace of events, it looks like you're doing something, but you're doing sort of far too much for any given period of time. And you can see that, and you can detect that um, by writing a property over the trace and say, I want to make sure that there's a certain number of projects within a certain period of time, um, thereby detect a certain kind of sidewalk. Um, and one thing that we are planning to do but haven't done yet is testing things where you've got different clocks in different areas, different time domains. So you've got, you know, there's a monotonic clock which is you know, always the same, but then the wall clock for different nodes might be uh, off um, by you know, some some number of seconds. And we want to be able to test the behaviour of of the algorithms um, when they're communicating between nodes that um, have a slightly offset notion of, of what the current time is. Um, so, to get to some conclusion, conclusions, um, I think it's really fair to say that the use of STM within Cardano has been a, a clear success for, uh, for Cardano. Um, so it's a, a good match of, of technology to, to the problem. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to claim it's universal, but um, I think it's been very successful across a range of applications within, within Cardano. Um, so, I think that's fairly reasonable evidence that it, it uh, has wide, uh, rather wide applicability. Um, I would probably go as far as to, to claim as wide applicability as, well, I, I think I think it's good as good as native Python. Um, I've always been a little bit of a skeptic of native Python, um, even though I was involved in helping uh, the writing the implementation of um, Cloudhaster, um, and and of implementing systems using Cloudhaster. Um, my experience of that. You know, left me much more skeptical of Native Python, whereas my experience of this has left me, you know, much more um, uh, confident that, that it's a, you know, widely applicable uh, tool and widely applicable approach. So the use of explicit pool-based protocols um, for distributed concurrency has been has been very good. That meshed very well with this style of pool-based or observer-based um, uh, STM uh, patterns that we've been talking about. Um, going back to my very first point about these performance curves, um, this does actually handle overload in the way that you would hope. Um, you know, we have system level benchmarks that try to flood the system with uh, with too many transactions, and it simply stops um, accepting new transactions when it gets to its limit. Um, because it's pool based, it just you know, whenever it's ready to accept more transactions, it, it gets them, and when it's busy, it doesn't ask for any more. Um, it's a protocol error to try and force it upon them. The concurrency testing has been very, very effective, and it sounds lots of bugs, um, and we found very few bugs in production, so that has been uh, successful. So despite it being, you know, everyone knows concurrency is one of the hardest things to do and get right, um, by by doing testing in a, um, you know, a, a systematic way, um, we, we have been able to, to catch those kinds of concurrency bugs um, and stop them from creeping into, into the production system. And perhaps it was luck, um, perhaps it's a good sign generally, but we didn't actually hit any of STM's uh, weak spots. Um, we had no problems with fairness um, in practice. Um, you know, one of the critiques of STM is that it's, it, compared to, say, MBARS, is that it doesn't give you uh, fairness. But we simply haven't had any situations where that has been a problem. Um, maybe, we're, maybe we're lucky, I don't know. Um, my, my intuition is that where you do need fairness, you can encode it. You just can't do it in a compositional way within within STM. You have to re resort to using STM with IO, uh, so you lose compositionality. 
I think it's a fair trade off. Um, we've not had any low level performance problems. Um, that may be just to do with the application where making smart decisions is much more important than making decisions quickly. Um, and we've managed to avoid having any long running SVN transactions. Uh, all the things we're doing with kind of finite numbers of reads and writes and relatively low numbers of reads. I think, yeah, message passing is the biggest contrast. I mean, I mentioned that a moment ago, um, but I think it's worth sort of emphasizing the, 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 the contrast. So message passing is push-based, and this pattern is, is pull-based. And that you know, has that big important difference with the, with the performance curve. Um, in, in message passing, you act on individual change events. In the state of progression style, you act on change, of, change state eventually. And that, that has an opportunity for, for being more efficient as more state changes over shorter periods of time. Um, the crucial thing, of course, is that message passing has these implicit cues, um, which means that Resource control is implicit, you know, depending on how big that, that queue gets. Um, you know, th that's the fundamental operation of message passing in, in this classic you know, asynchronous um, invoke style message passing uh, is that there's an unbounded queue. I mean, even if it's bounded, it's, it's, that, that has its own problems as well. But if you look at Erlang, Kyle Hasker, et cetera, um, other actual model things, they're using implicit queues which are unbounded. So your, your fundamental primitive doesn't give you any back pressure at all. Um, whereas this state observation style has it just naturally built in, and it doesn't, it's not even back pressure, it's just not going and asking for more work because it's all pull based. So there are no queues, and so your resource control is explicit, it's simply the size of those variables that you, um, that you create, and that doesn't depend on dynamics quite so much as you know, the length of queues does, it's just based on what you're doing. You, you've got full control over the content of those state variables. So in message passing, as I say, you know, there's no, no natural back pressure in this pull-based style. It's just sort of by construction. Um, and that, I think, is, I think that's very nice. So overall conclusion, you know, same as what I said at the beginning, concurrence is still hard. Um, STM, I think, genuinely does make it easier. Um, and it enables these interesting concurrency patterns. Um, I think it, yeah, it's a plausible uh, alternative to message passing for many applications, I would, I would suggest. Um, I think I think you know I think it's worth someone turning this into a uh, you know more a full fledged thing. You know, there's uh, there's lots and lots been written about actual models, etc. Um, I think there's there's something worth writing about here. I mean, I've just done you know some examples in a in a you know in, in a real application, but I've not you know done a full exploration of um, of this kind of pattern or, or tried to turn it. You know, this this is the first time I've really tried to turn it into a pull out what those patterns are. I think there's a lot further that, uh, that we could go here. Um, so with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a few people, um, a few different trumpets. Obviously, IOHK uh, from Berlin Cardano. And uh, um, we've also been working with um, uh, some excellent folks from Predictable Network Solutions on the, uh, on the networking side of things. They, they, had, they were you know, vital to, to contribute a lot of interesting ideas uh, that we made use of here and uh, also a few uh, colleagues of mine uh, at Lake Art. So thank you very much.